Christ course is Jesus at the Last Supper with his disciples ministering to those whom he loves, believers, uh, people who've uh, placed their faith in him and in his Father. And uh, it's, been, it's been so precious. We've been working our way through the 16th chapter. It's a long chapter, maybe the longest one in this particular discourse. And um, we've, we're working our way through, and we've seen that Jesus Christ, the portrait given is that he is the one to give the Holy Spirit. He will give us the comforter. He will send the Spirit of truth uh, from the Father. And the Spirit has a ministry in the world. Uh, to the world, it's reproof verses 1 through 11, and we covered that. But now to the believer, he has a threefold ministry, that of counsel and comfort and connection. And we saw how he counsels us, guiding us into truth. We saw how he comforts us in times of need when we are weak. Uh, the word comfort means more than just making you feel good. It's a combined word. It means with strength. Fortis is a fort. It's strong. He gives us strength in these times. And we were looking at these uh, verses last week, uh, verse 22, uh, Jesus finishing up the comforting ministry of the Holy Ghost. And, and uh, ye now therefore have sorrow. He's been told them, he, he's just been telling them, he said, you know, I'm going to be leaving you. I have to go away for a while. I've been with you for three and a half years. I've taken care of all your needs and your problems, but the, the shepherd must for a moment be taken from the sheep. And so you have sorrow. But I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice, and no man, uh, in your joy, no man taketh from you. Your joy, no man taketh from you. Th that is so precious. You know, in the world, there's a lot of platitudes that are spoken. And um, I hear this one over and over and over. I heard it in an operating room not too long ago. A couple of doctors were talking. And uh, in the operating room, there's a lot of people besides the patient and the doctor. The doctor has an assistant often. The doctor has uh, someone called a scrub nurse, sometimes two scrub nurses that are sterilized and working, and a circulating nurse, sometimes two circulating nurses that are running around getting supplies. So the room is full of people. And, um, and the conversation goes back and forth at certain times. And uh, I think the doctor was talking to one of the younger uh, assistants about going on and getting more education. And continuing your education, I think the assistant only had like a two-year degree and was very helpful in the operating room. Uh, but doctor saying, you know, you can go and get a four-year degree, you can go and get advanced training, you can move up in the ranks of uh, working here at the hospital. And, and saying, you know, and the important thing about getting that degree is you go out, you get the degree, you get your education, and no man can take that from you. And uh, I couldn't help but say something. And I said, well, you know, why don't you tell that to that doctor that just lost his license and he's in jail now? And if the world gives you a piece of paper, the world can take it away. You can get all the degrees you want, and if they decide to throw you in jail, your degrees aren't worth anything. They can take that license from you. They can take your ability to practice from you. They can take anything they want from you. Anything the world giveth, the world taketh away. And uh, your freedoms can be taken, and we've seen this in nations with oppression where dictators come to the throne and come in power. Jesus says... You've got something special. I, told, I said to them in the room, the only thing that can never be taken from you is your salvation. Amen. When Jesus Christ gives you salvation, no man can take it. You have what's known as assurance of salvation. And one of the assurances that go with that salvation, one of the fruit of that salvation is joy. The joy that comes from the Holy Spirit, when the Comforter comes to live inside of you and is given to you in the new birth, and it's the earnest uh, seal that God gives until the day of redemption. When he gives you your new body, the first thing he gives you is a spiritual part, and then he'll give you the new body in the future. That spirit working inside of you, the, the fruit of the spirit is love and joy, and no man can take that from you. That's why you can see the Apostle Paul singing in the prison in Philippi at midnight. And those prisons weren't like the holding centers here in Erie County. You know, with fluorescent lights and a television and cable and all that kind of stuff. This was a, a dank and dark Roman prison down in the ground in a hole somewhere with rats crawling around. And he's singing because, like Jesus said, your joy. When I see you again, he's telling the disciples, when I come back in my resurrected body and I say, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And you have the impartation of the comforter of the spirit that I will give to you then your joy, no man taketh from you. What a blessing. What a blessing. Christians should have smile lines. Christians should look like Sue Ann Nivens. That's an old show years ago. Mary Tyler Moore, but she was always smiling. She couldn't. And, 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 you know, and I find myself smiling a lot 
mostly when I'm alone with the Lord. <laughs> what puts a frown on my face is being with other people. Not, not, the, not the Lord's people, of course. I love the Lord's people. But it's just the opposite in the world. I watch people at work, and when they're alone, they're dour and frowning. And then when they get with a few buddies in the lunchroom, then they got that, that, that funny grin plastered on their face as they're telling dirty jokes. But I'm just the opposite. When I'm with them, I'm kind of frowning a little, praying for them. And when I'm alone walking down the hall, I'm smiling. So often I'm walking along the hall, you know, come around a corner. And just the other day, somebody said, you're smiling. And, and yeah, I have the joy of the Lord, I said. Because your joy, no man taketh from you. What a blessing. And that's, that's the work of the Spirit to the believer. And only to the believer. Only the believer has joy. The, the non-believer, the most he can hope to have is a little bit of happiness. And that's only if good things are happening. Hey, I won the lottery. You know, for 20 minutes, there's that happiness. Come back and see him in a few months. But your joy, no man take it from you. Now, the last ministry as a believer is that of connection. Besides counseling us and what truth is, besides comforting us, and when we are living for truth and standing for truth, and by the way, you know, the Lord would have us to live for the truth and to stand for the truth. And it's going to take strength to do that. And that's why the Holy Ghost is here to comfort and strengthen us so that we can live for truth that he's counseled us into. That we can, that we can go out and, and practice the truth and obey the truth. The comfort will be there. Not only that, he's going to connect us. Verse 23, John 16, verse 23. And in that day, ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. Now, the connecting power of the Holy Ghost is that Jesus is teaching them a new truth. Now, these are Jewish men. These are Jewish men in the, in the upper room. These Jewish men have been trained a certain way to pray. They had been practicing for centuries the very religion that God himself ordained. God, by the way, and you understand this, folks, and, and we'll get this again. How many religions has God ordained on the planet Earth? Only one. Old Testament Judaism. That's the only religion God has ordained. Old Testament Judaism. And even that he said on the sidetrack is now he's building his church and his church is not a religion, it's a relationship with God through Christ. But he did ordain Old Testament Judaism. So these men had been trained in, turn back to 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. So, so they're learning new truths in the upper room. Jesus is, is teaching them new truths. He's saying there's going to be a change that God is going to bring here. Yes, I'm a Jew. Jesus says. And yes, you men are Jewish. And yes, we have followed the Old Testament Judaism ways. But now there's a new thing God is going to be doing as he builds his church. And let me show you. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 33. Now, in this particular chapter, I'll just set it up for you. This is an incredible chapter here, 1 Kings chapter 8. Um, it's... It, Curiously, it's 66 verses. This little chapter here is a picture of the Bible. The Bible's got 66 books. You will find all the truths of the Bible contained in, in these 66 verses. I look forward to teaching you it someday when we get to Kings. This is a great chapter. And it's about the, the temple being a built, Solomon's temple. And the temple is a type of the Word of God. And it's a type of the Word of God being put together. And many great truths are found within this uh, chapter. Now, Solomon was praying, I'll just show you a little bit, um, he says, um, verse 27, Will God indeed dwell on the earth? The question that he asks. Uh, Behold, the heaven uh, and the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have builded. Yet have thou, God, thou, have respect unto the prayer of thy servant and, and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee today, that thine eyes may be opened toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said, My name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. Okay, so here's how they were taught. They were taught, God, 
has been dwelling with us in a tent. And that God says, now that we're here in the Holy Land, we have permission to build him a, a temple. And he will let us put all the articles of the tabernacle into the temple. And now that the articles of the tabernacle and the temple, he will come with the Shekinah glory down upon this temple and, and he will reside there. And if we are to pray as Old Testament Jews, the way God is teaching us to pray, the way we're supposed to do it is God's eyes, verse 29, thine eyes, God, may be open toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said, my name shall be there. So God is there and his name is there and that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. Old Testament prayer was to be made toward Jerusalem's temple. This is what God ordained. That's why you see Daniel when he's captive in the land of Babylon, he would open his windows facing toward the temple. He was out in the east so he'd open them on the west side and he'd face the temple and he would pray toward the temple. That's how he was taught to pray in the Old Testament. And that was the way you were supposed to pray properly. No matter where you were, you would face the temple. If you were up in the north country of Galilee, you'd face south toward the temple. If you were down in the wilderness of Kadesh Barnea, you would face north toward the temple. No matter where you were, if you're along the sea coast there, where the Philistines lived and you were captive there, you would turn to the east and you would face the temple. You were to turn to the temple where God had placed his name and that was the way you're supposed to pray. This is how the Jews did it. You see this imitated today. You see this imitated? The devil always counterfeits and imitates that which God has established a long time ago. Now, Jesus is telling the men, this is going to change. This is going to change. Verse 33, when thy people be smitten down before the enemy because they've sinned against thee and shall turn again to thee and confess thy name and pray and make supplication unto thee in this house. Again, that was the way they were supposed to do it. Then thou shalt hear in heaven and forgive the sins of thy people and bring them again unto the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. They were supposed to pray that way. Now Jesus says there's going to be a dispensational change. You're no longer going to just pray to the Father through the temple. John 16. Now you're going to Whatsoever, John 16, 23, whatsoever you ask the Father, praying to the Father in my name, he will give it you. Now, where's the Father residing? John chapter 4, we learned. No longer in for Jerusalem. No longer over there in this hill, Mount Gerizim, Mount Ebal. No longer in Mecca. He never was in Mecca. Okay, God the Father was only in Jerusalem in the Old Testament. But God is a spirit. And now they that spirit worship him will worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus said in, the, in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth and the life. If you want to have the way and the truth to God, now it's in my name. So I'm teaching you a new way to pray, ye my disciples. This is the last time you pray toward that temple. This is the last supper when you pray toward that temple. From here on forward, you pray in my name. What a great truth. Now, we all know it. We take it for granted. This was a major shift for these guys. This is a big change. This takes great faith. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. And if you ask in my name, verily, verily, I said to you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. We pray to the Father, coming in the name of Jesus, with the power of the Holy Spirit. He's our connecting power. The Holy Spirit makes the connection. We're here on earth. God the Father is in heaven. We're asking in the name of Jesus. And the, and the cable lines that run to and fro are the Holy Spirit. He's the connecting power. He's the connection that connects the believer up there to God the Father that we can ask in Jesus' name. It's all three working in harmony together. That's how prayer works. Now, he tells them in verse 24, Hitherto, until this time, ye have asked nothing in my name. You've always asked the Lord in Jerusalem. You've always prayed to the Lord, all caps. You wouldn't even say the name Jehovah. You would say Adonai. And you would pray to Jerusalem. But now ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. Now, I notice this carefully. Ask, and ye shall receive. Now, Jesus had taught this before. In the Sermon on the Mount, turn back to Matthew. Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 and 6 and 7.
and specifically Matthew 7 and verse 7. Jesus was getting these truths out there, but at the time he was teaching them in the parables in the beginning of the kingdom, which is one of his first teachings is Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he was speaking to Jewish people and he was showing them to ask the Father, but not in his name. He was just, he was exhorting the Jewish people to get back to an honest prayer life with God, the way they were taught to. And so he gives them a principle in, in uh, Matthew 7, 7, he says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Often we, we do not have because we do not ask. God has so set this up. Okay? I, I often, I, I mean, He knows what I need before I ask. But he's, he's, He wants such a close relationship with us, He wants us to ask. The, the Lord wants us to have a relationship with Him. He wants us to tell Him what's going on in our life. He already knows. Yeah, but he wants to hear it out of your mouth. He wants to hear that you know. He wants to hear that you know that you need. He wants you to come to yourself and recognize what your needs are and then ask humbly. Ask and it shall be given. Notice, ask, seek, knock. Look at the first letter of each one. A-S-K. Ask, seek, knock. It works out. It's a beautiful little, what do they call those uh, acronyms? Ask, seek, knock. A-S-K. Ask, seek, knock. But now Jesus says, don't just ask, seek, and knock toward the Old Testament temple. Now you're to do it in my name to the Father. Just close your eyes wherever you are and do it like that. God's a spirit. We open our eyes. We see the world. We close our eyes. We're in touch with the spirit. We close our eyes and we ask in the name of Jesus. And notice, go back to, I thought this was so curious the way this is written, because he writes it with an appositive in here. Turn back, I'll show you. Now he says, ask and you shall receive. In other words, when you and I go to God in prayer, we are not trying to overcome God's reluctance in a prayer. If we are going to God in prayer and we are asking in the name of Jesus, anything that would give glory and honor to his name, not just anything in his name, give me a Rolls Royce in the name of Jesus, but anything that would give glory and honor to his name, I want so-and-so to be saved and have the name of Christ. I want so-and-so to be closer to you in the name of Christ. I mean, these are the type of things, when you're asking in his name, well, you, you shall receive. And so, you're not overcoming God's reluctance, you're merely tapping into God's willingness to do things down here. And you're co-laboring with God toward that end. So he says, ask and you shall receive. But notice he puts, a, he puts a comma after the ask and a comma after the receive. He could easily have said, ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. But he threw commas in there. You know why? Because a comma makes in a positive between the commas and you shall receive. Meaning you can remove the positive and now the ask can be directly connected to the second part. Ask that your joy may be full. Not just ask that you may receive, but ask that your joy may be full. Do you know why some Christians don't have enough joy? They don't pray enough. The very um, process of asking and speaking to God and praying to God fills you with joy. Ask, and you shall receive. That's one thing you'll get from asking. And number two, ask that your joy may be full. Ask that your joy may be full. Your prayer life brings you closer to God and therefore gives you a greater cup of joy. That's another reason we need to pray. Not just because we've got a laundry list of things to get done, but in the very process of prayer, we're drawing closer to the one that's given us the new birth. We're, we're drawn closer to the one that loves us and when we're close to him, our joy is full. Ask that your joy may be full. Now, there are many ways to do it. Me personally, I mean, I pretty much do it all day long just walking around. I just don't spend time in a closet. I spend a lot of time instantly in prayer talking to the Lord. Pretty much the entire work day, I'm in prayer. <laughs> in that operating room, people sometimes wondering because my eyes look, you know, almost like they're glazing. They're not. They're not. I'm, I'm paying attention to what's going on in the room, but I'm in prayer. I'm in prayer. 
I'm praying for, well, that nurse isn't saved, and I'm praying for that doctor's not saved. I'm praying that patient that's asleep, he's not saved. I'm praying for all that. I'm praying that things will go well. I'm in prayer. I'm praying for folks in the church. I'm praying for other churches and missionaries. I'm with my eyes wide open in a trance, I'm praying. But, but that's, that's the way God would have it to be. What else are you going to think about? I mean, you know, what else are you going to occupy your mind with? Ask that your joy may be full. That's probably why I walk around smiling a lot. And he says it right here. Ask that your joy may be full. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Spirit's ministry is to connect you. And the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. And when the connection is going, there's love and joy. And when you put the phone down and you're no longer asking and you're no longer talking, well, the signal fades. And the joy kind of settles down to a real, real low. It ebbs real low down there. Wax is low. So ask, he says, in my name, you'll receive and your joy will be full. Then he goes, verse 25, Now these things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me and believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. And the disciples said, Lo, now speakest thou plainly and speakest no proverb. They're a little confused in, in, the, in the teaching method of the Lord. You ever get confused sometimes reading this stuff? I do. <laughs> I have to do a lot of asking. Lord, what are you saying here? Now, now let me just try and, and, and go over some of these things that he's teaching. First off, he says, verse 25, he, he makes it very straightforward to us. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. The Lord Jesus Christ's ministry made a significant change in Matthew's 13th a chapter of that gospel. Not too long into his ministry, he changed the way he was teaching from a very plain method of teaching to a parable method, to a proverb method. Now, proverb. Proverb is a compound word. There's pro and verb. Pro means, it's a Greek preposition or Latin preposition. It means before or uh, forth or forward or um, just plain old for. Like pro and con, for and against, it's for. And then verb is verbus, which is a word. So it is a, a, it's for a word. Now, of course, we know the word is Jesus. So the words you're going to speak is for teaching about himself. The word is the Bible. His words are going to be for the Bible. A proverb, in actuality, is a short sentence that expresses a maxim of truth. That's what Proverbs is. There's a book called Proverbs in your Bible, right? And they have little short pithy sayings that have great truth in them. They are, these truths have been ascertained by observation or experience. Now Jesus just said, I have spoken unto you in Proverbs. I have given you these short, great, deep truths that I have by observation and experience. Who's Jesus? Well, he's from everlasting. His observation is of the whole universe and his experience goes from time eternity past to time eternity future. You know, you're always looking for some good teacher. You can't get any better than the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, in, in uh, Luke chapter 11, turn back one gospel to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. You know, people, we, we sometimes go around uh, in this world <clears throat> looking for someone to help us, looking for someone to give us wisdom. I heard on a radio uh, program this morning that um, there was a, a writer for the New York Times, and he had written an article about some of the great murders that have happened in the last 50 years. 
And as he was r writing this article, he was realizing something is seriously wrong here. And he said, you know, I want to find out what's wrong with people that they're committing these heinous crimes. So he went around talking to psychiatrists and psychologists and university professors. See, he's going around looking for wisdom. He's see see seeking out and searching for people that he thinks can help him with wisdom. Now, look at this passage here. <clears throat> uh, Luke 11, verse 31, words are read, Jesus is speaking. He had gathered the people together, verse 29, and he said to them, verse 31, the queen of the south, shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. Why? For she, now he's talking about the queen of the south as the queen of Sheba. In the Old Testament, in 1 Kings, you'll find, for she, the queen of Sheba, came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Solomon had written the book of Proverbs. Solomon was given wisdom by God that the Bible says there was no man as wise as Solomon and no man would ever be as wise as Solomon because God imparted some of his wisdom right to Solomon directly. And Solomon wrote, I think it said 1,005 songs and 3,000, he wrote 1,005 songs. That's more than Lennon and McCartney, okay? <laughs> Lennon and McCartney, great writers, did a lot of great, it, he, I think that's like five times their output. He wrote 1,005 songs. And, and, he, and he wrote 3,000 Proverbs. And this woman came from the utmost parts of the earth to come to Solomon to hear his wisdom. He wrote the book of Proverbs, those short, powerful truths. Jesus says, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. You better believe it. Solomon would be the first to say amen to that. Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs and he got them from Jesus. Because Jesus is the one that gave him the words. You say he got him from God the Father. Well, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. They're, they're one in essence. They're one in nature. That's the Godhead. And greater than Solomon is here. Now, and, and, and Jesus is teaching his disciples, I have spoken unto you in Proverbs. Now, they were confused by the Proverbs. Christ's teaching, by his very nature, is spiritual. Because he has taken that of his father's, my father is a spirit, and he has given it unto you. That's what he said to the disciples. I've taken that which is my father's, I've given it unto you. I've taken the spiritual truths and I've given them to you. Now, here's a curious thing. You know, you see proverb. There's another word, prophecy. Again, it's got that beginning word P-R-O in there. Prophecy is, again, pro is to go before. Prophecy is to foretell events, to declare things to come, to preach and teach doctrine and truth, 1 Corinthians chapters 13 and 14, speaketh of comfort and edification, that's to prophesy, P-R-O-P-H-E-S-Y, and the, and the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy, did you ever read that verse in Revelation chapter 19 verse 10? The testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy, when he speaks he cannot but help tell you future events. So he's sitting in the upper room with these men and he's telling them about things to come in the future. And when you take the Lord Jesus' teaching, his spiritual teachings, his eternal teachings, and no matter where you drop them down at any point in time, those of us who are time-bound creatures are overwhelmed by the deep spiritual truths. And what happens is when you mingle the spiritual with the earthy, when you mingle the supernatural with the natural, you come up with a parable. So the proverbial teaching, the Proverbs of Christ are parables. A parable is a compound word. It means para and balos. Uh, balos, I'm trying to remember. Is that the one that means to throw down? I've got to check my notes here. But I think para, balos. A parable is uh, to throw down one thing against another. Yeah, balos is to throw and, and para is against. And so you're throwing one thing against another. He's throwing a spiritual truth against a, a, an earthly truth. And they should line up. So that's why you would talk about a sower goes forth to sow. Let me think. I understand that in an earthly standpoint. Now I'll give you the spiritual truth to it and I'll line it up. And Jesus would speak in parables. Speak in Proverbs. Don't be surprised if you're overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed by it. We continue to be overwhelmed by it. That's why we, we come very humbly to the book and we pray and we ask the spirit of truth to guide us into these deep truths. <clears throat> And sometimes our natural man is just like theirs. As they said at one time, speak no more to us in, in, in Proverbs. Disciples said, lo, lo, now speakest thou plainly and speakest no proverb. 
Now, there's a reason why the Lord Jesus Christ continues to speak in parables and proverbs. He explains it in Matthew 13. He, he puts it out there as a way to test hearts. Some people will turn from the teaching and therefore the very parabolic nature will prevent them from understanding it. And some people will turn toward the teaching and the spirit of truth will connect them to the understanding of what's in the parable. God reads your heart by how you respond to his parables. Ah, oh, that's baloney. That's ridiculous. He's just talking in a confused manner. He didn't even know what he was saying. What a rabble rouser he was. And as you turn from it, you're, the truth is turned from you. And if you go, you know, but I think there's something important in there. My heart's getting stirred by this. I'd like to know more. Then the spirit of truth connects you into the teaching. That's the spirit of truth's job, to guide you and me into truth. So he continues to speak in Proverbs and in parables. As a matter of fact, turn back to the book of Proverbs. That's why you and I search these things out in the scriptures. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1. Proverbs 1, 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, why are they given? Here it is, verse 2. To know wisdom and instruction. To perceive the words of understanding. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. See, God wants to teach us how to have real justice, how to have real judgment, so we know what's good, what's bad, what's safe for us, what's dangerous for us. Sometimes we get confused. Down here, the, the devil tries to mingle things up in such a manner, I can't tell, is it okay for me to do that? Is it not okay? Well, if we study the Proverbs and the teachings that God's put in the Bible, and the parables in the Bible, we'll be able to understand what true justice and judgment is, and what equity, what's fair, what's right. To give subtlety to the simple. I'm a simple-minded person. I need enough subtlety that I can understand the subtle ways of the devil so I can keep away from the stuff he's putting out there. To give the young man, verse 4, and the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. In other words, when you hear that parable, you have a will to hear it and increase hearing. Verse 6, the words of the wise and their dark... Oh, excuse me, on verse 5, I, I cut it off. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. When you start to get some understanding, you continue to attain to it. In other words, I observe people come back to Bible study. They go back home and they study their Bible. They're attaining unto it. They have a desire to know. Then the parables will be opened unto them. The Proverbs will be opened to them that ask, seek, and knock, it shall be opened. Uh, many times I come and I don't get this, Lord. What do I do? I ask and I seek and I knock. I say, Lord, please explain this to me. I want to know what the deeper truths of this passage are. And then after a while, not, not immediately, I have to wait sometimes years to get an answer. I might not be ready to bear it at that time. I, I mean, there was one conundrum I had and I waited three years before I got the answer on a Sunday afternoon in prayer at the bedside. I remember which side of the bed I was praying on when I, when I got the answer. It was great. <laughs> that was a great day. And, and you know what? But, but you, you, you stay at it. Just because you don't understand something doesn't mean it's not truth. It just means we're not quite ready to apprehend it. When God's ready, He'll give it to us. And the Holy Spirit will give it to us if we attain unto it and we stay at it and we have a will to increase our learning. Verse 6, to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. God clothes these things in parables and then he wants to see who has an interest. You know, it's a funny thing. The world might have no interest in the Bible, but boy, they have interest in finding out the secrets of magic. And they want to know the secrets of the occult. And they want to know the secrets of the Egyptians. And they'll attain unto that and they'll study the hieroglyphics and they'll go after these things. And God tests their heart. He said, they have no interest in my word. So I keep mine clouded to them. But my disciples that have a desire, back in John, ye ask in my name, it shall be given to you. Ask, ye shall receive, and your joy will be full. 
Isn't it great when you get one of these truths and they're open up to you? Back in John. The Spirit will connect you in prayer. The natural part of you and me, verse 29. <laughs> Look, just speak plainly. No more Proverbs, please. <laughs> I know, that's how we do. The, we're one of the disciples. I do that myself too. I read the passage. I go, read Zechariah. Read Ezekiel, folks. Okay? Come talk to me. All right? <laughs> Would you please open this? <laughs> Would you, could you state this a little more plainly, Lord? I don't get it. Deep stuff. Precious. It's great. You know the exciting thing about it as a Christian? No matter how long I live, I'll never fully get it. So therefore, I can always increase in my learning. I can always grow in the grace and knowledge of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, no matter how long I live. If I live a thousand years, this book is as deep as the ocean. A natural man says, give it to me all right now. I want it all right now. You ever feel it? I want all the Bible knowledge now. Don't speak in Proverbs anymore. Speak plainly. No, you stay to it, the Lord says. Now, now watch this. Now, here they are continuing to speak in the natural man. Verse 30. Now we are sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. There's that nice... Now, you know, let me tell you something. They hadn't quite been given the Holy Spirit yet. Their own spirit is speaking here. Jesus knows they're speaking of their own spirit. That's why he says in verse 31, Jesus answered, Oh, do you now believe? You think you believe? Jesus understands. There's a lot of times in our own spirit, a lot of times we're at a Bible study, and I hear this sometimes, and somebody say, I get it. And I'm thinking, they don't get it. And, and I hear these Bible call-in programs sometimes, and most people, okay, thank you, and they hang up, and you can tell they didn't get the answer. They're just in their own spirit, they're trying to go on. The Lord's just saying, you know, He knows that their belief is going to grow in faith. He knows that they've just got a little mustard seed right here. You're acting like you, you understand that I know all things, and, and you understand like you're ready on catching all these things. Do you now believe? Verse 32, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, now is come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. Yet I'm not alone, because the Father is with me. The truth of the matter was, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. And we have to be so careful in our own self, because we do have a natural spirit. I got the spirit of Mike, you know. I know Mike's spirit. I, I lived without the Holy Spirit for 39 years. I had the spirit of Mike running me for a long time. You got the spirit of filling your name. And, uh, and, and that spirit is the one we want subdued so the Holy Spirit can reign. And the truth is, if we do not let the spirit reign in our lives, then we'll be scattered too. So, and, and these men didn't have the Holy Spirit yet, but the picture still applies to you and to me. We will be scattered. Now, Jesus puts the picture right out there for us to see. In these men's lives, they did not have the Holy Spirit yet. The Holy Spirit had dwelt with them, but was not in them. And the Holy Spirit would not be placed in them until after the resurrection. And so he understood that the night when push came to shove, they would scatter in their own spirit. And when push comes to shove in your life and mine, in our own spirit, we scatter. That's another reason why we need the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And Christ gives us the Spirit so that we can stay connected and have the strength it's at the time when we're ready to flee and scatter. That's when we need to pray. Jesus says, pray that you faint not. Pray always that you faint not. Be instant in prayer. But the picture's drawn here for us. In real lives of real people, we would have done the same things that night, folks. Believe me. If you could get 12 of the, the biggest super saints living right here on planet Earth today and put them back in the upper room with him, they would have scattered too no matter how much rah-rah spirit you have. You need the Holy Spirit, which is why He's going to give it and why He's teaching them about it. In verse 33, He ends it in saying, These things I have spoken unto you, that, ye, that in me you might have peace. And there's the whole key, being in Christ. The whole relationship you and I have, it's in Christ. Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship with God in Christ. Christianity, Christian, it's to be in Christ, Christ in, to have Christ in you, to you to be in Christ. See, ye in me and I in you. That's the relationship. And if as long as we're in Christ, 
we have peace. If you're not in Christ, the Bible says in two places in Isaiah, there is no peace to the wicked, saith my God. There's a false peace. There's a lot of people running around with false peace. They have priests telling them peace, peace, when there is no peace. But the only peace you and I have, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. I've told you all of this before it comes to pass. I've spoken into you in Proverbs and in prophecy and in parable. I've told you what's going to happen. How about you and me when we go out there? Are we surprised that the world rejects us? Are we surprised that the world hates us? What? what the servant's not greater than his Lord. Did they hate our Lord? Did they kill our Lord? We shouldn't be surprised. I mean, are you surprised at the way the world acts? Are you surprised at the way Hollywood behaves? These are people that hate the Bible and hate the Lord. How else are they supposed to behave? Are you su surprised at the way the gay pride parades are? How are they supposed to behave? They hate the truth. They hate Jesus. They hate the Bible. They got to pretend Jesus they may love, but not the Jesus of the Bible. So, so in the world, what do we see? He tells you, in the world, you shall have tribulation. You're going to see tribulation in the world. You're going to see trials and troubles. Come on, sister. You're going to see tr trials and, and, and tribulation and troubles in the world because the world has rejected Jesus and the Father. He told you in the last chapter, 15, verse 24, they have hated both me and my Father. The world crucified him. So what do we expect? Trials. Troubles. Tribulation. How do we respond? With a big smile. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit that connects us and he says this, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. We have the one that's conquered the world. He's conquered the world and Satan and sin and death at Calvary's cross. Isn't that a blessing? We can be a good cheer. He has overcome the world. We have victory in Jesus. God gives us the victory in Jesus Christ. And these things are spoken to comfort our heart. Now again, when our hearts don't have comfort, what do we do? We go right back to what he said. Ask that your joy may be full. Get back to prayer. Get back to your Bible. Listen to the words again that the Lord has given you. The comfort of the scriptures. The comfort of prayer. And the joy will be full again. And you'll understand, okay, there's a real division down here. There's light and there's darkness. There's good and there's evil. There's those who are of the word and those who are of the world. And there's a division. And it clears up all the confusion in our minds. And so the Lord gave this great teaching that I will give you the Holy Spirit. He's going to reprove the world. He's going to let the world know you're in darkness. You're doing the wrong things. He's going to invite the world to come to Jesus. He'll testify of Jesus. That's what he does. He'll testify, remember, of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. That's the Holy Ghost's job to the world. You're in sin. You need the righteousness over here of Christ. If you don't come here, there's judgment to face. But to the believer, he gives us counsel, he gives us comfort, and he connects us with the true God, the only God that exists in the universe. That's the God of the Bible. That's the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other God. There are a lot of false gods, a lot of idolatry. So the 16th chapter is a great chapter in this Upper Room Discourse. Now we're going to, it, it seems impossible to go any higher, but we're going to go even higher in the 17th chapter. Because in the 17th chapter is going to be recorded for us the Lord's Prayer. Now, a lot of people think the Lord's Prayer is found back in, back in Matthew. Turn back to Matthew. And this is recited a lot as the Lord's Prayer. I think it's Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And picking it up in verse 9. teaching them how to pray. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now that prayer is often recited over and over in a repetitious manner, kind of warned against earlier, verse 7, when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. They think they'll be heard for their much speaking. But that's not exactly the way this prayer is intended to be used. He just told you earlier. But this prayer is used often and it's called the Lord's Prayer. But the truth is, it's the Lord's teaching prayer to you and I as disciples. And actually, it's not so much to be repeated as he says, after this manner, therefore pray ye, verse 9. He didn't say, use these exact words. He said, in this manner. In other words, I'm giving you an outline how to pray. When you first pray, acknowledge that God is your Father in heaven, and his name is holy. Remember who it is you're talking to. You're talking to a holy God. After this manner do you pray. You're talking to the holiest being in the entire universe whose nature is nothing but holy, holy, holy. There's no shadow of darkness in him. And then remember, it's his kingdom. And you're praying for that kingdom to come because it's not here yet. <laughs> They're going to have an election in 2004. They're not going to bring the kingdom of God down with this election, okay? <laughs> no matter who wins. Even if a born-again president wins, it's not going to bring the kingdom. So you're praying for the kingdom to come. In other words, you're praying, Lord, come back. The kingdom doesn't come till the king returns. Mm -hmm. And he's telling you, and, and he's saying, and you pray, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. In other words, thy will be done in earth, starting with me, Lord. <laughs> Help me to do your will today. Not, not, she needs to do that will, you know. She's really out of line, Lord. And by the way, those, those politicians need to straighten out. And those gay people need to stop marching. No, that's not how the will gets done. The will gets started with you and right here. The Bible's always aimed to us first. Remember, you aim the Bible at yourself. You never point it at someone else. That's how you read the Bible. Aim it at yourself. Husbands don't read the verses about wives. Wives don't read the verses about husbands. Children don't read the verses about parents. Wives read the verses directed to wives. Husbands, you read the verses directed to yourself. Someone came and asked me about some of those wife verses one day. What do you think about I said, I don't even read them. I mean, I read them, but I don't think about them. I'm not a, I'm, I, you know, it's none of my business. I'm a husband. I read the ones directed to me. I'm supposed to work. I'm supposed to take care of the family. I'm supposed to raise the children a certain way. Those are the ones I read. I don't read her verses. Thy will be done right here in this earthly being first. This is the manner that he's telling you. Give us this day our daily bread. Okay, I'm in America. I got plenty of wonder bread. I need this bread, the bread of life. This is what I need to feed my soul. This is the manner he's teaching us to pray in. The Lord's Prayer directed to disciples. John 17 is the Lord's Prayer that he personally prayed to his Father. This is high ground. This is as high ground as you get. I'm going to take my shoes off while I read this one. Because this is holy ground. It doesn't get any higher than this, than this chapter right here in the Bible. You've got Jesus praying to his Father and, and that same spirit of truth recording it for you and me in the Bible to read. That is just amazing. And we're not even going to start this week because we're running out of time. We're going to get to it next week. We're going to look at the Lord's Prayer as Jesus prayed to his Father. And this is only for the ears of believers to hear and for the hearts of believers to enter into. The world has no part with this stuff. We're going to learn a lot of great truths next week. Any questions on what we learn in John 16? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You are holy, Lord. And so is thy holy child, Jesus. And so is the gift of thy Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you that Jesus, because of his death and willingness to sacrifice and commend his love toward us, and through his resurrection has now given to us the spirit of truth. Help us, Lord, to accept his counsel, to receive his comfort, and to stay connected with you in prayer. Teach us to ask that our joy may be full and that the gifts we receive, may we give to others, because freely we have received, freely shall we give. And the greatest gift we can give is the gift of salvation.